Considered one of the top medical researchers in, infectious, in the disinfectious disease world, Dr. Gerberding started her career at the University of California, San Francisco's Epidemiology Prevention and Intervention Center at a time when AIDS cases were first appearing in the US. Little was known about the disease and fears of contracting the disease were running rampant. She is credited with conducting milestone research and helping establish guidelines on how to help people uh, infected with HIV in the workplace and how to prevent the transmission of this disease to healthcare workers. Dr. Gerberding went on to be the first woman appointed director of the CDC. Here she found herself on the front lines dealing with SARS and the West Nile virus. Currently, Dr. Gerberding is an executive at one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, Merck and & Company, and we're absolutely delighted to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Gerberding. Good afternoon. It is an incredible honor to be here, and it is a special honor that Gilbert is here. Um, this is a name lecture, and, and when you have some honor like that, it's important to get to know the people and why they were so generous to create this opportunity for Princeton. So we had a chance to chat about that, and it's quite impressive. Uh, uh, a, a couple who are both incredibly dedicated to science and science policy. I'm also excited to be here because I had a chance to meet with a few students today, and I will be having a chance to meet with many more students over the next two days. And I feel like I'm in the candy store of creativity and great ideas. This is a remarkable institution and a huge privilege to be here. I need uh, some help with the page turner here. If I can have the clicker. There we go. Um, I found this wonderful quote from Dr. Gilman in Science Magazine. I thought it was a good way to start because it really illustrates um, the kind of experience that people have here at Princeton. That this is an environment where curiosity coupled with goals is very productive. And students do get out of their narrow focus and have a chance to interact and connect and create new ideas and new energy. So I think it's a wonderful spirit for this lectureship. And I'm again, I'm very, very proud and honored to be a part of it. I have to start with my conflicts of interest because I am working in a regulated <laughs> industry. So these are my conflicts of interest. I am in the private sector role, but I'm also on the faculty at UCSF in medicine and infectious diseases and sit on the board of trustees at Case Western Reserve, my alma maters, times two, thank you. I think uh, I, Dr. Mahmood was my mentor at Case, so um, I thank him for this distinction as well. And then a number of global health foundations that I care deeply about. Um, but the little picture is also um, uh, what is my real interest in life. I'm a doctor and I love medicine and I love patients and just about everything I do can be linked back to that um, place in my heart. I'm gonna just start with a little story. Um, my husband and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia and we had a, a, a home with a quite big backyard and we learned to garden. It, I hope you can see in this picture there's a little pond, lots of beautiful trees, flowers and pots and so on and so forth. So we really enjoyed creating this experience. But um, somewhere uh, in the midst of 2002, my husband called me and said, I'm having the worst headache of my life. Um, and lo and behold, he acquired West Nile virus in that very backyard when he was mowing the lawn on a Tuesday night, not wearing a shirt. So he managed to get bitten by the infected mosquitoes at the peak of the uh, outbreak in the southeastern part of the United States. And uh, I had the, uh, made the mistake, I guess you would say, of announcing that during a congressional hearing and then on NPR radio, and my husband has never forgiven me for <laughs> not following the HIPAA requirements. So we um, subsequently moved to Abington, Pennsylvania, and we love this area of the country. It's beautiful. We learned to not have standing water on our property. Our frog pond is, uh, has a pump, and we've got lots of frogs. And, uh, things that eat mosquitoes, so we thought we were in really, really good shape in our new backyard environment. But of course, about three weeks after we moved, guess what? Um, these are not pictures of my husband, these are CDC stock photos, but <laughs> my husband got Lyme disease, and shortly thereafter, I got Lyme disease, and now each of us have had it two times. So we're starting to get the impression that we're living in a very complex ecosystem. 
And then finally, um, I'm a cat person and I have collected a variety of stray cats. This little critter was in need of veterinary care and so I was trying to trap her. And um, my trapping experience was not very successful. Um, I subsequently discovered when we got her to the vet that she'd probably been in a fight with, with the raccoons that hang around our property. I ended up with a horrible pasteurella cellulitis in my hand and had to get rabies prophylaxis because of the problem of rabies raccoon in the east coast of the United States. So I'm a walking textbook of <laughs> zoonotic diseases and I could tell you other stories as well. But I, the point I'm trying to make in this introduction is that all of us live in an ecosystem where the connection between animals, humans, the environment, hosts and vectors is increasingly relevant and increasingly complicated. And we really do have to learn how to live in this one health environment. So the term one health is really a, 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 a phrase that refers to this ecosystem or very systems oriented approach to understanding how pathogens, for example, move from one species to another and why things emerge and spread. Um, it's a collaborative effort. Many disciplines come into play in One Health, and I suppose it should not surprise me that the term was coined by someone at Princeton, um, which is really, and you're pointing as if the person is to please wave your hand if you're here. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, because this is, you know, an epicenter for interdisciplinary work, but also the concept of One Health um, is one that now is finally taking on some energy. Even CDC has a One Health office. And when I was there, we hired 28 public health veterinarians to help us with the One Health agenda. And at the WHO and other parts of the world, increasingly, this is a focus for research and intervention. And it's no wonder. This is a map that shows just some of the zoonotic or animal sourced infectious diseases that have emerged in the last few years. About 72% of all new infections come from animal sources, either directly or indirectly through vectors. Significant proportion are, are transmitted by arthropods, including mosquitoes and ticks. Some are transmitted by rats which are, uh, and other rodents, which are very good vectors of transmission, and many are sourced in bats. So for today's conversation, I'm going to be talking about the mosquitoes, the ticks, and the bats. I left out the rats because I just couldn't deal with the possibility of a rat-borne zoonosis in my backyard. <laughs> so let's start with the menacing mosquitoes. Um, in the United States, there are really four main kinds of mosquitoes that we have to worry about. Um, there's Culex, which has a number of species. Um, these are, I think of them as sort of the rural mosquitoes in the sense that they travel long distances. You find them out around rivers. They're mostly in, uh, mosquitoes that like birds and uh, really weren't designed to be important in the human population, but of course they're quite adaptable. Anopheles mosquitoes, I think everyone remembers, is the transmitter of malaria and a few other things. Uh, and then the Aedes mosquitoes, Aegypti and Albopictus, which are the ones that we're really focusing right now in the context of the diseases that are in the news. I, for fun, and especially if you have kids, just take a look at these pictures, because you can tell these mosquitoes apart. We have them all, and I'll show you that in a minute, but Culex is the humpback, so it has a little crook in its back. It sort of has a like a, a, a bump. Anopheles feeds by standing almost perpendicular. So when it's biting you, you can see it almost straight up and down. Whereas the Aedes species have these interesting little stripes and they're also flat when they land on your skin. They tend to sit like this. So if you look carefully, not that you want to spend a lot of time looking at the mosquito that's about to bite you, <laughs> but you can get a, a, a good impression of specifically what you're in store for depending on its landing site. So Culex is the main mosquito that transmits West Nile disease, many other arboviruses, including uh, Japanese encephal uh, encephalitis. Anopheles, I said malaria, but it also is the source of canine heartworm, as well as uh, filariasis in some parts of the world, some species of filariasis, and some other um, tropical fevers. The Aedes mosquitoes are the mosquitoes that are transmitting dengue, chikungunya, uh, yellow fever and Zika. 
kind of Egypti is the main culprit, um, but Albopictus, the tiger mosquito, is also implicated in at least dengue and chikungunya. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Aedes mosquitoes are non-travelers. They like to grow up in your yard and stay in your yard. So the bad news is they're really adapted to interacting with humans and they know how to feed and find humans. They can uh, lay their eggs in a bottle cap if there's water or moisture in it or in leaf litter or in your um, gutters. They're really adaptable to urban environments and they don't go very far so they um, tend to really congregate successfully. Well, I went to Puerto Rico with the CDC and we were taking little vacuum cleaners, believe it or not, into people's homes and sucking up what was in their closet to see what kind of mosquitoes they had in there. And you know, you wouldn't think about that being a particularly hospitable place, but we found lots of mosquitoes hanging on people's clothing and in moist areas of the home. So they're in your houses as well as in the yard. The distribution of these mosquitoes is what's really causing a great deal of alarm. On a global basis, you can see that they are largely tropical mosquitoes, but look at the United States in terms of Egypti as well as Albopictus. Um, we are in the Albopictus region here in New Jersey. Uh, the people in the southern states have both mosquitoes in their backyards, literally. And this is a concern because if chikungunya um, becomes adapted to albopictus and worse, if Zika becomes adapted to albopictus, then we will have the potential for these diseases to also crop up in other parts of the United States. Um, the Zika cases that we've seen so far in the United States have been limited to travelers but we are seeing transmission in our territories, and in particular in Puerto Rico, where there's probably, I'm not trying to make news here, but I would not be surprised, shall we say, if there's more transmission in Puerto Rico than we yet even have been able to test for or diagnose. So of the 39 proven cases of local transmission uh, in the US territories as of last Friday, um, uh, only, in addition to the 39 local cases, one of them was, only one of them was due to a traveler, whereas all 107 cases in the United States were due to people who'd been in parts of the world where this is endemic and have come home. This will change, and you should expect um, more states will have travelers when there's a million of cases going on in the southern part of the Americas, you can only expect that we're going to see more travelers and more cases. And I would not be surprised if at least in the very southern parts of the United States we would see transmission because we've seen it with dengue. So we will um, anticipate this. Please don't be alarmed if you read about it. I'm sure CNN will make it into a very large news story. But um, you know, it's a predictable surprise, not one that we should take lightly or not deal with, but one that we should anticipate and to the best that we can prepare for. What's making Zika, of course, so dreadfully complicated is that we are seeing complications that we didn't expect to see. Um, microcephaly, for those who aren't familiar, simply means small head. Um, probably that means that babies that are developing in the first trimester of pregnancy when the mother gets infected um, don't develop properly. Um, maybe because the virus itself is infecting the nervous system or, or stem cells that give rise to the brain, or possibly because there's some immunologic response or both. We don't really know yet. But the more worrisome thing in the last couple of weeks is that we're seeing more than just um, microcephaly. We're seeing examples where the virus has actually been present in other body fluids. So of, in the amniotic fluid of the baby and the pleural fluid around the lungs and the fluid around the heart, that it looks like the virus is capable of infecting a developing infant much more broadly than just in the nervous system. So that means that babies may be born who have other problems or other birth defects that haven't yet been noticed or detected. And of course, there's concern that there's a high rate of lost um, babies um, due to miscarriage or stillbirth as well. The problem with all of this is that most of this is occurring in communities that have very poor surveillance, very poor diagnostics, no baseline, 
And now everything that happens to any baby is being attributed to Zika. So we have to really do the science and sort this out before we can truly understand what's going on. Likewise for the Guillain-Barre syndrome, which you may recall is a disease that happens when usually following an infection, when an immunologic reaction um, cross-reacts probably with nervous tissue and takes the myelin off the nerves, which is the coating that helps nerves transmit faster. And when the coating's gone, um, people become paralyzed in those parts of their body. It's temporary. You can recover from Guillain-Barre, but it can be very serious, of course, if it's affecting the respiratory muscles, et cetera. And there seems to be an association with Zika infection, although, again, very difficult to know if it's Zika or if it's something else and choo-choo and unrelated. Now, I'll just say here, because I'm going to make this point in a minute, that um, we are surprised by these complications unless you go back and really read the literature from the Zika outbreak in Yap a few years ago. Because if you really carefully read what the people there were saying, they think they saw some microcephaly and they think they saw some Guillain-Barre there. Um, small numbers of cases compared to what's going on in this part of the world, but um, something that maybe would have given us a hint that we ought to have been expecting this and perhaps creating systems to be more sensitive to detecting it earlier in the process. Hindsight is always 2020, but it's important to learn from uh, what we look back on. So I guess the question with this menacing mosquito, the Zaides mosquito, and this particular virus, which is just getting started in our part of the world, is why is it here now? Um, why is it so large scale? Why is it happening so fast? The orange parts of the world are the parts that we knew had Zika. Uh, remember, it was found in a rhesus monkey in 1948 in Uganda. So it sure took its time getting here. Now all of a sudden, it's taken off. Why is that and what is really going on and how can we make sense out of this? I don't have answers to that, but that's part of why we need the science of One Health to help us move forward. Let's move on to talk a little bit about the biting bats. I've never been more fascinated by an animal than I am about bats since I started understanding their biology and their ecology. This is just a list of some of the viral infections that bats harbor. And it's interesting because these are really bad viruses. They usually, except for rabies, don't make the bat sick but they spill over into other primates and sometimes into people directly or indirectly, and they cause some really bad diseases like Ebola or Marburg, like SARS, like MERS, like a number of the other emerging infections that have been upon us in these last um, several years. A variety of that bats and a variety of viral infections, and it would be fascinating to understand why this is going on. At CDC, I had the privilege, really, of going out to a bat cave in Uganda with a team of mammalogists and others who were trying to solve for the source of Marburg virus, something very similar to Ebola. And so we went into this cave. There were 450,000 bats in the cave of two different species. We had to wear complete biosafety equipment because we didn't know what was in there. Um, we were investigating it because some villagers had died of Marburg and they had been in the cave. Um, the bats come out at night and they are trapped in things that look sort of like tennis nets or harps, depending on the size of the bat. And then these incredible scientists take them back to this makeshift laboratory, which the night I was there didn't even have electricity. They were doing their work with Petzl lights. Um, to dissect the bats and to find the tissues and sort it all out, freeze them and send them back to CDC so that they could be studied. And this particular journey actually led to the um, proof that these bats were in fact the source of Marburg. They met all of the criteria for causality, which has been actually very hard to do for some of these viruses. But it was a lesson to me, again, in ecology. Because while we were out there in this remote part of Uganda at night, you know, a chimpanzee would walk by and 
little rodents would walk by and many birds were looking on and mammals that I couldn't even identify were there. So trying to figure out which animal is relevant in which ecological niche is really a tough job. So be patient when people can't tell you right away where the new infection is coming from. It's really hard work. It's very painstaking science, but it's incredibly exciting and interesting as well. Now before I say um, some of the worrisome things about bats, I want to remind everyone that they're actually really, really important for human and animal health because they really do help control mosquitoes, among other insects. Um, they pollinate. They are absolutely critical for food and nutrition in many parts of the world. They also create a number of products that we use, and we've learned a lot from them in terms of how they echolocate and use their hearing for sonar um, sounding and directionality. Of course, they also have crime fighting <laughs> capabilities. It's very important to appreciate that as well. Here's some interesting at least interesting to me facts about bats. There are 950 species and they account for 25% of all mammal species. Think about that. They're incredibly adaptable. They're in every continent and they have amazing adaptations including to echolocation which I just mentioned. They live a really long time even though they're little and have high metabolic rates. They're kind of designed for transmission of bad things because they roost together and then they fly to the next roost. So if bad A has something, flies to roost, a, roost B, he just brings that with him and then everybody in that close quarters gets infected. They also have nurseries where they deliver babies. So all the pregnant bats go off by themselves and you know that's a messy process because they're mammals. So they can easily transmit bloodborne viruses in that environment to their offspring. Um, they amazingly don't get cancer. Now that's an interesting observation. I don't know who knows this, but I think it would be important to find out why that is or if it's true, why it's true. And I think the other thing that fascinates me is that it's the only mammal that flies. And when they fly, their body temperature goes up. So by definition, any virus in a bat must be temperature tolerant. It must be able to tolerate fever. So maybe that's one of the reasons why there's success, such successful hosts for viruses that when transferred to human beings, we normally mount a fever. We can't ward off these viruses because they're indifferent to our first line of host defense. Just a speculation, but I think it's an interesting area for further research. Now when the Ebola um, outbreak occurred, it didn't take too long to figure out that the fruit bats were responsible for the outbreak. And I, I don't think there's any dispute about um, the, the proximate source being the fruit bats. We've known this for a while and only recently we've been fairly convinced which bat species are actually three bat species at least that we know can transmit Ebola. These are the previous outbreaks. And you can see they've been spaced out over time. And while some of them have been very challenging for people at the local level, they've really fortunately not involved very many people until this outbreak, which isn't even drawn to scale where there's more than 11,000 um, affected people here. Um, what happened? Why did we go from something that wasn't easy to contain, but certainly containable, to something that looks like this? And I think that's the question that we, again, have to look to a One Health orientation to answer. These are the epi curves for the countries um, over this period of time. And as you know, every once in a while we ping with another case. Um, in part because we're seeing delayed transmission from people that we thought were recovered from Ebola but are harboring the virus in their semen and are sexually transmitting it to others. So um, this is an outlier. You know, why did this happen? Now the third, um, the third mystery that I wanted to address is the mystery of the terrifying ticks. This is a female deer tick after she's had a blood meal. Uh, on some unlucky deer or probably some unlucky human being. In New Jersey, there are four ticks that we have to be concerned about. The deer tick, the dog tick, the lone star tick, and the brown dog tick. 
And they're shown here in terms of their sizes, not drawn to scale actually in their lifespan. And I think the key thing is how big they get when they're full of blood, but actually how little they are when they're in some of their um, non-fed states. And of course, males don't feed. It's only the females that feed on blood. The deer tick in particular is a tiny tick. That's a dime at the bottom of the picture. Um, as an infectious disease doctor, I'm quite familiar with people coming into the office with something in a bottle that is usually a tick. Um, and usually it's a huge tick. Usually it's a dog tick. And you know, trying to reassure people, thank goodness that's not a deer tick, that's a dog tick. Your dog may have something to worry about, but you, you don't need to be worried about this particular tick. Um, the, the, tick, the deer ticks are very little, and even the female, unless she's just had a blood meal, is small as the ladder on a dime. So don't be confused that every tick is not a deer tick, and not every tick is a reason to be concerned about uh, Lyme disease. They, as a group, encompass a very large part of the United States. The, um, Black-legged tick or the deer tick is mainly in the east and southeast, but the Great Lakes region also has its share of, of um, these ticks. The um, lone star tick is more dominant in the southern part of the United States, but again is in New Jersey. The um, uh, American dog tick is west coast and half the rest of the country apparently doesn't like really dry areas. And then the brown dog tick is pretty much everywhere, and that's one of the main causes of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is why you can get that disease just about anywhere in the US. But the deer tick up here is the one that I'm going to focus on today. And the deer tick not only causes Lyme disease, but it causes three other um, diseases that are not fun to get. So it is one that we have to be worried about. The map of Lyme disease just gets worse and worse every time I look at this. Um, this is 2013. When I look back at what we knew in 2003, it was mostly gray with only a few areas where the, the case density was as high as it's shown here. And this uh, disease is what I would refer to as hyperendemic in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and, and the Northeast. We have so many cases that they're probably not even counted or reported. So it's uh, extremely ubiquitous. And again, we don't know why it's so common, why it's getting so much worse now, although with this one we at least have some ideas. What's also fun about this, if you're an infectious disease person, not if you're a patient, <laughs> is that um, we're learning as our science gets better and our diagnostics get better that the situation is even more complicated when, than we knew. This is a New Jersey um, case report of a new species of Lyme, Borrelia myomotai, or myomoli, I'm not sure how to pronounce it because I just learned about it. Um, but this was reported by a doctor from New Jersey who put the first case report in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2013 and then um, a case series that followed with collaborators in this region who have found that there's another bacteria, uh, another um, organism that is responsible for Lyme disease. And then a report that just came out a couple weeks ago from the Midwest where they have found a new um, Borrelia as well one that actually causes Lyme disease, but it tests negative in some of the Lyme tests that we have. So it could be a reason for a false negative. Very few cases, but in that part of the world, it's something that now has to be added to the list. So what I've really been talking about with these mosquitoes, bats, and ticks is the concept of emergence, where infectious diseases that we didn't have in a place and time before suddenly appear and or expand and move and cause significant trouble for human health. And the concept of emergence is you know, easy to get. I think we all can see something is emerging, but it's very difficult to understand. And we really are just beginning to have theories about what is causing emergence. So because Dr. Oman has um, expressed interest in grand challenges in some of his previous lectures, for example, at the American Association of Science, 
uh, the AAAS, he um, has reviewed all of the grand challenges that have been important in the history of science in the United States. And I'd like to challenge him to consider emergence as another grand challenge, because I think we have an opportunity here to really come together in a multidisciplinary way and concentrate on this, because it really matters to human health and to animal health. And there is so much opportunity now given the scientific tools that we have to really peel away the layers of the onion and understand what's going on in the environment, what's going on with the vectors, what's going on with the hosts and the people. But here are some of the factors just to um, level set the starting point for this. Um, we know that population and demography around the world is obviously changing, not just aging, um, but numbers of people and the uh, vulnerabilities and susceptibilities that people have to diseases and their own um, movements around the world. Urbanization in particular is a very important force. It was urbanization that really, I believe, is the leading hypothesis for the size of the Ebola outbreak. Um, that in those past little outbreaks, there are more in rural areas, smaller cities, these outbreaks that happened the last couple of years have been in major urban areas where there really were not facilities and health infrastructure to contain the problem. But urbanization also means that people are moving closer to animals. They're encroaching the previously privileged areas of the forest where animals like bats or carriers of ticks might have lived relatively undisturbed and where spillover into people was a relatively rare phenomenon. So as this trend toward urbanization continues, particularly in developing parts of the world, I fear we're going to see more Ebola-like outbreaks because the number of people potentially affected is going to increase. We're also living in a world that has a great deal of um, unplanned social disruption and displacement. 2014, almost 60 million displaced people in the world. And think of what's been going on in 2015. I'm sure the number is higher um, now than it even was a year ago. So when people are displaced, they get all mixed up with each other. It creates an environment for diseases to transmit. But also, um, they're vulnerable because they don't have good nutrition. They don't have good hygiene. They don't have any of the things that would allow a, an emerging disease to be diagnosed and effectively treated before it spread. So it's hard to see probably in this slide, but that's a refugee camp on the left. And imagine if there was an Ebola outbreak in a refugee camp. You know, just one case of Ebola in there could be absolutely devastating to a huge community of very, very vulnerable people. So people are also moving um, further distances. This is just a historical perspective on SARS because I love the fact that someone at CDC spent this much time making this graphic. Um, but <laughs> it's the story of the first known patient with SARS who um, traveled from China to Hong Kong, stayed in the Metropole Hotel, Hotel M as we say in government. And while he was there, there were a lot of uh, other people in the hotel including um, these people who didn't know him and to the best of anyone's ability, we couldn't find contact between him and any of these people. But he was actually very ill with SARS, likely highly infectious, and somehow transmitted SARS to these travelers during the three days that he was in the hotel. These people left the hotel and they went around the world. And this is how the SARS outbreak began. One sick person in one hotel in Hong Kong infecting travelers who then globalize literally within just a few days an emerging infectious disease that up until that time we had never heard of. And that virus went to Canada and Germany and Bangkok and various other places in Asia and really precipitated the initiation of what amounted ultimately to 8,000 infections and a pretty substantial fatality rate. So travel is an obvious multiplier that does help explain why things move and why they move quickly and why we can see something in one place one day and then the next day it's everywhere. You think about how much travel there is. 93,000 commercial air flights a day around the world. 
And that's just the commercial flights. That's not ca counting cargo or any other kind of flight. So people are really on the move and we're not able to keep things in one place very long. It's not just air travel though. The story of AIDS, um, I think convincingly demonstrates that it was the construction of the Trans-African Highway that actually allowed AIDS to move across Sub-Saharan Africa along the truck routes where truck drivers were likely having sex and um, transmitting the virus to their contacts and then going home to their villages and bringing the virus home with them. When you look now at what's going on in South America with the Trans-South American Highway that's now been built from the West Coast to the East Coast uh, and the incredible opportunity for not just vectors but also plant pathogens or other human pathogens to move into rural communities that previously had been isolated but now are open to travel and inter, uh, integration with people from all over the place. And this household is up, um, a household I visited up in um, the mountain area in Peru. Um, and yes, that is a turkey in the house, but we were there for dengue. Um, we were sucking up mosquitoes in these houses also. It's not really my pastime, but it is a fascinating um, thing to do. And while we were there, we actually um, made the diagnosis of dengue fever in a 12-year-old girl at dengue hemorrhagic fever. But um, the density of mosquitoes in her house was unbelievably high because people don't have um, access to good running water and um, appropriate uh, hygiene. So this is, you know, this is one reason why I think the Aedes mosquito that we're worried about is going to be a formidable foe when it comes to managing Zika and who knows what the next virus to emerge in those species will be. And then we can not even think about Asia where there are all kinds of new highways planned reaching into sectors where billions of people live, uh, many of whom have previously been isolated. And then sick people move when they're sick to try to get care, but also health workers who go to help come home. And we saw the consequences of that with Ebola where healthcare workers return home. And it's not even just the people who are traveling. I won't go into the story in detail, but there was a period of time when we had a monkeypox outbreak in the United States. And when CDC traced it back, they found out that there are people who just love exotic pets and they like to trade them at weekends at pet fairs. This was a list of what was in one shipment of rodents from West Africa to a pet store in Texas. Included in the shipment were 50 giant Gambian rats. Not my choice of a pet, but um, what can I say? These rats were harboring the monkeypox, and they transferred it to a colony of prairie dogs who then you know, got cuddled by children and adults and managed to move the monkeypox into uh, the Midwest of the United States in a pretty fast order. So the animals moved. Um, the birds move, these are the flyways that were of importance in the H5N1 avian influenza outbreak in 2005. And uh, obviously um, that creates the opportunity for a great deal of one health concern. I think the biggest unknown right now is what effect does climate have on all of this? Are we really seeing changes in vector competence or vector biology that's increasing the number of vectors available to spread diseases like Zika. And when you think about climate change and all the human health effects, uh, obviously changes in vector ecology are an obvious area. If it's too cold, things may not breed. If it's too warm, maybe they breed faster. It's kind of obvious that there would be some impact of climate change on vectors. But many of these other areas are also influenced by climate and will have an impact on emerging infectious diseases. Water, um, the security and supply of water and food, and even <coughs> the kind of social disruption that environmental degradation and problems will create for people. So climate change is going to make a difference. We just really can't say how and when and how big and how much and, and exactly why that's going to be nor do we have particularly effective monitoring capabilities in place right now to try to understand or tease this out. For better or for worse, 
the vulnerability of our population, the translocation of people, animals, and vectors, um, climate and ecological change are adding up to be a world that is increasingly afflicted with emerging infectious diseases. And these uh, emerging infections aren't just because we have better diagnostics. These are real problems that are true and um, affecting a lot of people. So because this is you know, a policy institution, I thought it would be good to end with just a couple of thoughts on what are the policy implications of One Health and these emerging zoonotic diseases. Um, so I have a, you know, a little set of ABCs here, but this is incomplete. And my grand challenge to you all would be, this would be a great topic for some really bright and clever people to really think about. It seems clear to me that we do need to anticipate that this is going to happen. Every time it happens, people act surprised. But don't be surprised, it's going to keep happening, I can guarantee it. I don't know where and what, but it's going to happen. And we need better One Health science, and we need global situation awareness about where these things are going. There are all kinds of wonderful collaborations cropping up. Um, this one between China and the US in terms of veterinary medicine but there are all sorts of academic collaborations on a global scale that are beginning to patch together a piece of the science for this. Um, I think it's gonna be very important to follow the mosquitoes because we know that these viruses follow their vectors and understanding where the mosquitoes are is going to be very important in predicting where the infectious disease outbreak will occur next. And we should expect predictable surprises. When you look at the previous slide, where are the where the vector is, where the mosquito, then why wouldn't we be surprised, uh, why would we be surprised to see chikungunya in Europe and the United States or dengue in the US? Because the mosquito is there and the people are there that are harboring it, so why wouldn't we see it? Just like um, when we were dealing with West Nile, why were we surprised that, oh, you could get West Nile from an organ donor or from a blood transplant? Um, and looking even now with Zika, um, it took a little while for us to figure out that maybe people with Zika should not donate blood. It's kind of a predictable um, surprise. Not that you want to jump ahead of the science, but you got to be ready to skate to where the hockey puck is going to be. And clearly it should not have come as a surprise that we were going to have an Ebola patient in the United States with all that travel and all of those health workers who were over there doing their thing. Um, it, was, it was a predictable surprise. So when we see something happening somewhere in the world, we should assume that it's not just a problem over there, it's a problem that could happen here too. Right now, we've learned something about the bat species that reservoir Ebola, and models at least have determined where the bats are um, that will likely transmit and how many of them contain the virus. And we know about 120 million people live in close proximity to these regions of the world. So um, we may have managed to combat Ebola successfully in three West African countries, but there are a lot more countries in West Africa that haven't now developed the capacity and the knowledge of what to do. And so there are still lots and lots of people there who are vulnerable to Ebola, as well as in other parts of the world. And likewise, um, with the Lyme disease problem, I mean, I think we do know that the number of deer, at least the number of the deer in my yard, 17 this weekend, um, is a, a big part of the challenge that we have. In the 1700s, the northeast part of the United States was full of ticks and full of deer. It was a huge problem, but there were no people here, so we didn't see much Lyme. A hundred years later, an entomologist was surveying for ticks in the same region, could hardly find a tick. Um, because the deer were gone. They had been hunted and they had moved west. And so there really was no, um, no tick disease and, and no propensity for that. There only harbored ticks on some islands off the east coast. So in the early part of the 1900s, um, we can retrospectively recognize that there was Lyme disease on one of the islands off of Manhattan and that the deer tick was present in some of the other regions. But of course, as we've changed our ecology and our human behavior, the deer have come back, we have no predators, and so we are absolutely anticipating a bigger and bigger problem with Lyme. And that really leads to the whole policy issues around 
deer management, around vector control, around chemicals that may be important in managing mosquitoes and ticks, and even things like genetically modified mosquitoes or possibly someday genetically modified ticks that are not competent to transmit or self-destruct as in the case of some of the mosquito science that's going on now where, the, for example, the, the father mosquito, the male mosquito is engineered so that when he mates, he passes on to his offspring a lethal gene and those mosquitoes cannot grow up to be adults. So in small communities, this has proven to really bring the mosquito population down. And we have a lot to learn from that aspect of science, but we have to be willing to do the science and as scientists, we also have to be willing to stand strong on the science and not let um, popular paranoia interfere with what really is an important set of steps for combating these diseases. We do need better detection and protection capability, and I won't dwell on this except to say that we need a strong WHO. WHO is really the only supranational entity in the world that can do uh, the things that it's supposed to be able to do with the mandate that it has, and yet it has not been able to perform its responsibilities for a lot of structural reasons and a lot of funding reasons, and we need to fix that. But we also need to have countermeasures for the predictable surprises before they arrive. Um, it's easy in retrospect to know which vaccine you wish you had. It's not so easy prospectively so we have to take advantage of our new science and do that ahead of time. And as I've mentioned about vectors and hosts, um, we have to do a better job of really understanding their full ecology. Um, raccoon rabies in, in uh, New Jersey is a big deal. We have not seen humans get raccoon rabies very often. It's quite rare but the density of raccoons and the densities of rabid raccoons is not going down. So we're moving further and further into a territory where we're creating risk. And what I think I have in that top picture, again, my poor husband, but if you can see he's holding our cat, he's in the house, the raccoon is outside of the house, we keep our pets inside because we don't wanna have another ecological experiment in our backyard. Finally, we must commit to a sustained engagement. I've been in the world of infectious disease since AIDS happened in the early 80s, and what I have seen is feast or famine. A problem emerges, money comes. The problem is managed, the money goes away. So all of the things that we know we should do don't get done in a sustained basis, and that's where citizens and citizen activism <laughs> People just need to be able to throw up their hands and say, enough already, let's actually try to create some solutions here and not constantly exist in this reactive mode where um, once we get rid of the urgent crisis, the, um, the funding goes away. And the Secretary General agrees with that, um, but I don't think he's in too many conversations with the United States Congress or the political leaders of some of the other important developed countries that are working on this. So uh, these are, in my view, the priorities that we have to concentrate on as scientists and citizens and collaborators. Um, but at the end of the day, the biggest lesson is it's just a really, really small world and we are all in this together. Thank you. No, at Case Western Reserve. Case Western. Okay. And um, <laughs> uh, after doing a one house pre presentation and a bit about some of the more ecological factors that go into it, I was wondering um, how do you think our approach to medicine should be more holistic and related to the ground? You know, I just, I love the idea of schools of health. And I think that includes medicine, nursing, dentistry, pharmacology, um, and 
you know, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, I think it, it includes the traditional human health professions, but I think it also needs to include animal health professions and the engagement with schools of veterinary medicine. Um, that's really the premise of One Health, and some schools are already ideally situated for that, schools that have schools of veterinary medicine and schools of medicine, for example, like UC Davis comes to mind. Um, but when you think about it, as health professional students, whether you're human or animal um, focused, the curriculum at the beginning is the same. You're learning anatomy, you're learning pharmacology, you're learning much of the same thing. And there's a wonderful book called Ubiquity, U-B-I-Q-U-I-T-Y, which is written by a, 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 a woman who is uh, medically trained but then um, was working in animal science. And she was able to learn from her animal engagement things that she never would have understood about humans and people by being able to cross over and see like why do goats faint and things like that. So that she, she developed all these amazing insights because she crossed the boundaries out of the human perspective and really embraced um, a much broader learning opportunity. So I, I don't think we, um, we have an easy way to do this because there's something called accreditation and the accrediting bodies have theories about how people should learn and what they should learn and when they should learn it. So it's gonna take a lot of change and experimentation to really realize that vision. But Case Western Reserve, which is uh, my alma mater and where I um, knew uh, Dr. Mahmood when he was a professor there, um, has cre is creating a school of health. And at least they're taking their health pro uh, professional schools that they have, which does not include veterinary medicine, and co-locating them in one building. And the students, are, the building design forces the students to interact and learn together and the classrooms and curriculum are being developed in a collaborative way. So it can happen to get there. to know that if we were to eradicate one species, what would that do to the, to the vacuum, basically, yeah. that you create? Do, are, are people studying sort of the interaction between mosquito populations? Uh, absolutely, although I don't think we've scratched the surface. Probably the place where we know the most about the ecology is Puerto Rico. And the reason for that is the CDC has a field station there and has had it there for a really long time. It's one of the major places where vector-borne diseases have been studied. So on a population basis, in a pretty small island, they've been able to map out the whole ecology of the mosquito populations and where they are and why, what happens when you introduce an intervention, what is working and what isn't working. So I think it's knowable, but you know, the island of Puerto Rico is tough to generalize to the you know, city of Rio de Janeiro, so I, I don't think we have a very good understanding. It would be hard for me to imagine that something didn't fill the vacuum, mm -hmm. but the, the one thing about Aedes that makes you a little bit more optimistic is that they don't move a lot. So even if you got rid of them and the Culex came in, you, know, you don't want to have a lot of Culex around either, but they're, they're better. I'd rather have probably West Nile than Zika. Yeah. I'm just saying, unless I'm old, in which case I'll, I'll take my chances, but. I don't, you know, and I have no awareness of that at all. It would surprise me if that was a tick-borne disease, but I. What about, um, we see some research on in the United States today about found outbreaks in private schools, and 20%. Interesting. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to know more about it, because that's, so new, that's new to me. Yeah, that. very cool. Hmm. Did you say Titusville? Titusville, yeah. Pennsylvania? Uh, no, but Oh, okay. Different titles. Okay. Um, um, I was actually surprised uh, that a lot of the issues we discussed today were fairly ancient. You know, we go back to the 1400s, 
It's really complicated. Well, let me, let me just make a couple comments. One is probably one of the things that I worry about a little bit are the bat viruses, because they're all single-stranded RNA viruses. And, uh, you know, we may have a vaccine for Ebola today, but that's no guarantee that that vaccine is going to be effective in 15 years because single-stranded RNA viruses often mutate more readily than double-stranded viruses do. So I think that's that's one area of concern. A second um, aspect of what you're talking about is given that there's almost an infinite number of possibilities, how do we choose where to focus our attention and knowing that it is a system, if we perturb it in one direction, isn't that going to create an offset somewhere else or an unintended consequence. And I, I think um, that's true. But, you know, think about childhood diseases that have been largely eliminated with immunization programs. That's a pretty big perturbation of the system. And yet we've been able to manage that without really creating an unintended consequence that at least I can appreciate as a, as a negative unintended consequence. If, if we manage, for example, vaccines to um, flaviviruses and we can truly reduce the burden of disease, not only does that help in terms of the vaccinated people, but it also reduces the potential for transmission because it's the mosquito, the Aedes that's moving this virus from one person to another. So if you get herd immunity, you can really you know, have a significant impact on the population. But modeling would be one really important, and field experiments would be another. And multidisciplinary research would probably be the third thing that we need a lot more of. This is really just a wonderful lecture. The uh, nomination of the Center for Epidemiology and Modeling for such a really eminent major field of uh, educational biology and bioinformatics as a part of this program of initiative for admission. Because one of the traditional approaches that have been embraced before was that um, in the case of uh, zoonotic diseases, there's been some spaces set up in, uh, you know, the streets of Bergen and some places in Europe or, or Europe or in Chinese cities or in Central America and some other places as I understand it, um, including in academic labs, UCLA and other places, specifically to monitor the animal scanners, because they might be the first line. The sentinels. I think that's one way of um, relatively early detection of a problem is find the people who are like the sentinel chickens, the people who are most likely to show disease or illness first. Um, there's some subtle problems with that because, for example, um, with dengue or shepherd's pox, can you be someone who's handling animals a lot may actually be less vulnerable if there is immunity. immunity that could, I mean, just speculating that would be one thing. But I, I, I agree that, that th those are good populations. I also um, think that you go where the problem is. It's bats and rats. So, you know, having better surveillance of what bats and rats, where they are and what they're doing, but also what they have is really smart. Because if you could understand bats and rats, you'd probably solve 80% of the problem. So, you know, I didn't talk about rats today, but I, I could next time. <laughs>
where the social costs of the research are the most impactful. I, I'm, are you speaking of, of corporate social responsibility? Or I'm, I'm, I just uh, didn't quite get the question. Yeah, just in general, like, for like pharmaceutical companies, compared to like the CDC, do you think they have like very different levels of responsibility because um, they can kind of be like synergistic or um, stick together better than like the individual researchers? Yeah, it's, just, it, it's um, a, a topic for a great conversation and a great debate. I, I feel very confident about um, my experience in both government and the pharmaceutical industry, as well as my experience in academia, that in all three of those worlds that I've experienced, um, the thing that <laughs> makes them alike is the sense of purpose. You know, when I was in academia, we knew what our purpose was. It was to take care of patients. I went to the CDC, we knew what our purpose was. Um, and I'm in the pharmaceutical business. I was involved in the vaccine business. We knew what our purpose was. We wanted to get HPV vaccine protection to the kids in Africa who needed it the most. So when you're working with people who have a mission and understand when they get up in the morning, why do I get up in the morning? That's the thing that drives a lot of other decision making. And I don't think Merck is unique, but I think I'm proud of the things that Merck has done in this regard. The River Blindness Program is a huge example of making ivermectin available in perpetuity for anybody in the world who's at risk for liver blindness or filariasis. And I think what we're doing right now in terms of Merck for Mothers is another piece of that. Or how um, a, a CEO of a company, Mr. Fraser at Merck, um, would just, when, when we went to him and said, look, Here's Ebola, it's horrible. We don't have the vaccine. These people have a pretty good start, but they can't make it. We have the cell line that it grows in. We think we can help. What do you think? And it was, it's the right thing to do. We'll do it. So, you know, we're, we're a business. They're there to make money for shareholders. There's no denying that. But at the same time, you can be an ethical business and you can be a business that's full of people like you who want to get up in the morning and feel their purpose. Now, I'll just give you one kind of aha moment for me pretty early in my tenure. I went to Ireland because there's a manufacturing site there that was involved with making the HPV vaccine. And it was a new facility and they had a big wall like this and there's a map of the world on it and there are a bunch of red dots on it. Each red dot was a thousand deaths from rotavirus infection on a global basis. So every red dot and this too many red dots meant that a thousand children typically would die from preventable rotavirus infection. These people who worked in this factory would celebrate every time they could take a dot off the wall. And what was so amazing to me is they didn't make the vaccine there. You know, it's made somewhere else at Merck, but they just wanted to feel like they were part of doing something in the vaccine world that was really important that they personally really cared about. So I think at the end of the day, we're all just people. And if we try to remember that, we'll have good lives and you know, we'll have a lot more respect and the ability to cooperate and do things in more of a shared value model. Oh, I cannot remember which bats are suffering from white nose disease in the U.S. Um, they're being, yeah, you know, they have colony collapse from, it's a fungus, right? And yeah, and it's, it's devastating and it is an issue for pollinators and for others. So I, but I don't know if it's true to an unrelated. Um, I mean, I know it's unrelated. I don't know if, if it's the same bat species or not. So sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amazing.